looking back, so you've, you've been at the ICC for quite a bit, first as deputy prosecutor and as chief prosecutor. What would you have done differently with the Kenya cases? Look, it's, um, there are many things that have happened in the Kenya cases that are not under the control of the, of the office. And I, I think you would, uh, you, you would realize that. Um, I believe that our duty, our responsibility to investigate the case, um, to come up with the charges and uh, get the charges confirmed, I believe that we have fulfilled that responsibility. This is what is in our control to do. Um, and we did that. Uh, with respect to the protection of witnesses, for instance, those who already gave us the um, evidence, which we used, um, we have done as much as we can to, to ensure that these witnesses are protected, etc. But obviously, what we have done and, and the counter forces against that was probably no match for that. It was much more difficult uh, in the case of much more challenging when it comes to not only the bribery, but also the intimidation of those witnesses that uh, we have, we have found. So the, the fact also that after um, this, for instance, Mr. Kenyatta was charged already, it was afterwards that he became president, is not within the control of the ICC. Um, the fact that the witnesses uh, had to turn, perhaps because of this new situation, was also not within the, 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 the um, responsibility of the ICC or within our power to control. So there were many, many things that happened in the case that perhaps if it were, we were to charge him again and he's still a leader, perhaps they would still happen. And this is one of the reasons why I said at this moment, I do not think that um, it is conducive for me to conduct any further investigations into the situation in Kenya. So these are the, these are the difficulties that just came. It's just all the circumstances that surround the case that happened, which we, um, as an office, were, were not able to, to, to control. So if you were to tell me that, um, uh, what would I do differently? Uh, what we could do to investigate and prosecute uh, the case, I believe we have done to the best of our ability. But the circumstances that happened, that caused the case uh, to be withdrawn, not all of those circumstances are in, a, in my control or in the control of the office to be able to change them or do it differently. Were you surprised by the, by the bribery, the issues of bribery and intimidation that are happening in the Kenya cases? Well, I, I, wouldn't, say, um, I wouldn't say I was uh, surprised um, as such because um, we did have indication very early on that uh, this could happen. This could happen. I, I believe what has surprised me is the level, really, the level of uh, witness interference. As I said, is unprecedented. Can, can, you give us some, can you give us some examples of that interference and that unprecedented level of intimidation and interference? Indeed, we have uh, been able to see that there is a scheme a scheme in which several people were involved and the, 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 they, they were going after different witnesses, not just even only in Kenya, but also those who were outside of Kenya. Uh, we have uh, already uh, shown that there, there is a very high level of bribery of these witnesses. Um, recently, you have seen uh, the, the uh, incident of what happened with one of the witnesses. Um, regarding whether he was missing or whether he was uh, dead. I, I believe all of those are ways in which um, they have attacked the witnesses. I, I have said several um, times that the witnesses in that case, in these cases, um, are under siege, really. There, there is a very high level of intimidation, and I've said this publicly several times, and of course, I have given you the example of uh, when I was withdrawing the case. If you recall last year, uh, or, or in 2013, on the 19th of December, if, I'm, if, uh, if I recall, I had to ask for an adjournment 
of uh, the case, the case of uh, uh, Kenyatu, Mr. Kenyatta's case, because we had some very two critical witnesses you know, who were the ones who actually were placing Mr. Kenyatta in very you know, key places. And uh, those witnesses, one of them uh, came out to say that he no longer wants to speak to the office. He's withdrawing his um, testimony. And the other one said, everything that I told you was a lie. And these were very critical witnesses who gave us the evidence, evidence that we used during the confirmation of charges, which the judges uh, believed, and we lost those witnesses. So I was forced at that time again to take a very difficult decision of asking for an adjournment of the case to see whether there, would, whether there was a possibility of replacing the witness, the evidence. Last year, when I had to finally withdraw the charges, when the judges uh, said that I, would, I should either proceed or withdraw the charges, I was forced to withdraw the charges because the evidence actually did not improve at all. And uh, I, I said to the judges that uh, those witnesses, those evidence that I was trying to get to, to continue with the case, I've not been able to get it. I also explained about the non-cooperation of, uh, of the Kenya government. And these are, these are the issues. These are the, the why um, I was forced to, to withdraw the charges. Um, and this is an example of, 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 of just what can happen uh, in, these kinds of, in these kind of cases. And it did happen in, in, the, in the Kenya case. Now, you said you've learned some lessons. Uh, over the, this Kenya case has brought a lot of lessons to you. What do you think about this, the idea of summons to appear mm -hmm. for somebody in power as opposed to a warrant of arrest? You see, this, as, as you, you've rightly said, it's, um, it's lessons uh, learned. Um, and some of these decisions we, we need to take on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you cannot say that as long as it's a sitting head of state, you should give summons to appear or you should give an arrest warrant. With respect to uh, a sitting head of state, for instance, uh, an arrest warrant can o equally be difficult to implement. We have seen examples of that. Uh, at the same time, there is uh, also the possibility that they, they, they can be arrested. We've seen the example of Charles Taylor. When Charles Taylor was indicted and an arrest warrant against him, he was a sitting head of state. Eventually, he was able to be uh, arrested and, and brought before the special court of Sierra Leone. In fact, I want to make that difference because people think that Charles Taylor was tried by the ICC when, when it was the special court of Sierra Leone. We have seen the example of Milosevic when he was also indicted. Um, he was uh, then uh, also a, a sitting head of state. So the, the examples, the, the, the cases can be different. It is possible that uh, a warrant of arrest will work, but it is also possible that it may not work. And we have had both examples. So w the assessment is really done uh, at the time when you decide whether to issue an arrest warrant or whether to uh, issue a request for the issuance of a summons to appear. The summons to appear was first used in Kenya cases, isn't that right? Indeed. And this is where this is the, but this is also the cases where you say there's been most interference mm -hmm. and intimidation. Would you not say there's a link between the two of them? Look, we have issued a summons to appear uh, in the Kenya cases, and we have seen that they have come to to respond to those summons to appear. Um, I I think that if even if the uh, intention has always been to interfere with the witnesses whether it was a summons to appear or an arrest warrant, I think that would have been done anyway, because uh, um, ultimately the beneficiaries of that interference are those that are before the court. So I, I don't think it, it, it would matter if there was a summons to appear or there was a, uh, an arrest warrant.